This episode is sponsored by Datadog. With 350 plus integrations, as well as metrics, logs, traces, and APM, Datadog enables your team to quickly find and fix issues before they escalate. Visualize your microservices architecture with a service map, spot unusual trends with a log patterns view, and monitor the availability of your services with synthetics. Start a free 14-day trial of Datadog today and receive a complimentary t-shirt by visiting bit.ly.com slash datadog shirt. That's bit.ly.com slash datadog shirt. Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and today I'm talking with Lauren Maffeo. She's a principal analyst at GetApp. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, and I'm happy to be chatting with you. So GetApp is a, a Gartner company. We are. So we like to say that GetApp is TripAdvisor for B2B software. The idea is that if you are a smaller mid-sized business owner and you need different software to run your business, whether it's HR or marketing or business intelligence software, you would go to getapp.com. You would read LinkedIn verified reviews of thousands of different cloud SaaS products, you would filter by the features you need, and eventually you would choose the tool that is the best fit for your business in the context of your app stack. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, and I, I, spe I speak from ignorance, so forgive me if these are dumb questions, but I read a lot of like Gartner reports and like analyst reports, and I wonder what is the skill set of an analyst? I mean, you have, you, have to, you have to know business, you have to know technology. How do you keep track of it all? And what is your background? Yeah, it's a great question. I was a media studies major in college, so I don't have a computer science degree. And I actually think that my media studies education was better preparation for my career as a Gartner analyst, because a lot of it is doing large scale evaluation of different technologies and really separating hype from what's realistic for business owners to be doing now versus what they should be doing even in five years time, because you need to advise them on when to make the right investment in those technologies. And oftentimes, for example, we as analysts for small and mid-sized business owners will tell them this isn't the right time for your small business to be investing in blockchain. It's not going to reach maturity for five to 10 years. And so you're better off investing in this until then, or we'll say to them, AI isn't this all encompassing technology. It's actually integrated into a lot of very popular cloud SaaS products that you probably use every day, whether it's Google Drive or Slack. And so this is how you can start thinking about using AI in a more productive way. So a lot of it is educating the masses and really speaking to your audience in terms of their level of technical expertise. Oftentimes, our readers and software buyers are people who are pretty technically savvy, but they just want to know more about particular products. And that's a separate ish audience from someone else who needs the tools, but really is starting from scratch in terms of their knowledge of the SaaS landscape. Mm -hmm. So you are truly an analyst and you are analyzing your, it's a multi, um, I'm trying to think how, what's the right word for it. It's uh, multiple disciplines to be able to do analyze these things and to provide a bridge between, like you said, the regular person and the technical person. That's true. And I think the distinction as well is that you have to be up on your game in terms of technical expertise and understanding your audience, but you also have to be able to distill technical concepts in a pretty easy to digest way. I was at a conference out in San Jose last year and overheard an attendee say, I know a lot about blockchain and what it is. I still really don't know a lot about what it actually does. So if I had to distill my role as an analyst into one sentence, it would really be to explain what these technologies do on the business side. Mm -hmm. And you do have a, a master's degree, but you've also done, you followed up with additional certificates. And anytime you can take classes, I guess you recently took a class at MIT at the Sloan School to kind of start getting up to speed on, on AI. Is this an area of interest? It is. I, I am most interested in AI and I'm happy to specialize in it. Last year, I noticed that Sloan was running courses on AI for business strategy. And that's actually a 
course that I haven't really seen replicated in many other places. Even if you look at MBA programs or other similar higher education programs, you often find AI it you know lumped within a larger computer science education. And it's not that that's a bad thing, but in terms of the very particular application of AI in business contexts. There isn't a lot out there besides the MIT course that Sloan offered. And I found it so relevant to my work as an analyst that I decided to take it. And it really has paid itself off in spades in terms of what I learned and my ability to apply it to my work as an analyst. I also went on to co-author a research note for Gartner Enterprise clients on the use of what we call everyday AI in social software applications like Slack in Google Drive. And everyday AI is something we define as AI that is so subtle, you don't even realize that it's in the system. And the goal there was really to emphasize to the report's readers that you don't have to be scared of AI. It's already part of tools that you're very familiar with. And understanding the benefits that it brings to your work will help you make more informed choices about integrating AI further into your business. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you were concerned about, and as you have been exploring the area of AI, is this idea of bias in AI. And I've done a couple of, uh, of shows about that. How does bias get baked into AI if people are, if people mean well? Like, I don't want to bake bias into my software, if I can avoid it. That's a great question, because I think when we talk about bias in AI, the end result, whether intentional or not, is that it comes off as purposeful. And the reality is that it's more often not the case. It's more often the case that bias creeps into the data sets used to train machine learning mm. algorithms as indirect bias. And that is when you have byproducts of sensitive attributes that correlate with non-sensitive attributes. So when we're talking about a sensitive attribute in the context of bias, it's something that is direct. So let's say you're building a machine learning algorithm that is going to give home, home loans to potential housing buyers. You, An example of a sensitive attribute would be race. And so an example of direct bias would be that you are specifically excluding black people from the data set or you're exclusive or you're intentionally giving them lower loans. That's an example of direct bias. Indirect bias, again, is an unintended correlation of sensitive and non-sensitive attributes. And so one example is that you might for have with for example, redlining, which is a practice that would, was common in Portland, Oregon for over a hundred years, redlining basically locked black people of color out from buying homes in certain areas of Portland. And even though that was declared illegal in 1990, we still have over a century's worth of data that was predicated on practice that's now illegal. And so if you were to use that data in a data set to train an ML algorithm, you might be indirectly reinforcing bias, even though that's not your intent. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's interesting to point that out, that it, it can happen even though it is not your intent, but it's a very sensitive topic. So if someone then, let's just say, criticizes and say, hey, look, your your area it has bias, and you go, hey, I'm not racist. I didn't mean to do that. It's 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 it creeps in there whether you are explicitly doing it or not, and it's the awareness of that that's important. Definitely. So, and that's the thing that I always try to emphasize up front when I give talks on machine bias in ML algorithms. I first start by saying we all have bias as humans, whether we acknowledge it or not. I say to them, I'm no less biased than you are, just because I'm up here giving this talk, and we and again, it the data sets that are used to train these ML algorithms are so complex that there really is no way to take bias out of the algorithm. But there are specific things that you can do from the outset of the product's life cycle that will mitigate it throughout and hopefully keep you from retraining your model from scratch. That's something else I emphasize is the concept that 
ethical debt in this case bias is actually technical debt because if you find out down the line that your algorithm is unacceptably biased, your only recourse is going to be to scrap the model and completely retrain it. And that creates an enormous amount of work for your team when you're already working on a very complicated problem. So if you work to mitigate bias from the start, when you're writing your tech spec, you can eliminate a lot of those issues moving forward. Mm -hmm. How do we catch all the things though? There's always going to be an exception right? Like you and your, you wrote an article for opensource.com where you talked about how, you know, not everyone thinks about how their models are going to be used. And if you don't consider all aspects of how your, uh, your model will be used, you're going to find yourself in a situation where someone could potentially be in life or death. And one of the examples that you gave was, uh, like a self-driving car or something that takes voice commands. And, uh, like, for example, my wife is constantly frustrated with Alexa because, uh, she has an accent and it doesn't seem to understand her like it does me. So she'll actually ask me to tell Alexa stuff. If we were trying to tell Alexa to stop doing something dangerous or turn something off that needed to be turned off immediately, we could have a real, a real problem. I love that example that you gave because it's something that I use in my talk on machine bias as well. I specifically talk about a woman named Dr. Carol Riley, who is a very renowned AI expert. She's an entrepreneur. She has a PhD in the subject. And when she was building a voice command interface using Microsoft's speech recognition API, she found that her own creation couldn't recognize her voice, presumably because the API was not exposed to enough voice variations in training. And so then it couldn't recognize accents, inflections, or even people of different genders. And so Carol wrote an op-ed for TechCrunch where she talked about how she tried lowering her voice and her own creation couldn't still recognize her voice. And the end result was she actually had to have a male graduate student present her, her own work because it couldn't recognize her voice. And the example that she uses in her op-ed is to think about self-driving cars and to say, this is a mild, maybe somewhat humorous problem, but think about the implications if you are in a life or death situation with an autonomous product and you need to communicate with it, but it doesn't recognize your voice as human. The consequences could be very serious. And I think because we are still in the early days of AI's fourth wave, this is the time now to be acknowledging the bias and designing products that are more thoughtful. Uh, so it really isn't just about doing what's quote unquote fair. We need to design with consumer safety in mind. What would you say to someone who might be listening to this podcast and listening to this conversation and might be thinking uh, to themselves, you know, this is a, uh, an overly progressive viewpoint, an overly liberal viewpoint, or you're making computers political and computers aren't political. Is this a political thing or is this about software doing what software is supposed to do? I, it, it, my opinion is that it shouldn't be a political thing, but it is. There's, I think. I would say, I would argue the whole concept of diversity and inclusion is one that has been politicized. It is often seen as being politically correct. And I view it as a business strategy because the management research is quite clear on the consensus that more diverse teams not only produce more fi stronger financial returns, but they also build products that serve a wider range of users. So mm -hmm. I would approach it from that perspective. And, and similarly, again, when you're talking about building data sets that are less biased or built with bias in mind, you're talking about not only serving a wider range of users, but you're talking about mitigating the risk, the risk of work down the road. So my argument is that it's a, it's a technical strategy and a business strategy in tandem, but I'm afraid that in this especially politically polarized climate, it has become an issue. I am, however, heartened by the fact that I give talks on machine bias at pretty mainstream tech events like DrupalCon North America and the Open Source Summit. And I've met a wide range of people in the sector who are not only aware of this problem, but do want to take it to the next step and solve it. So that gives me confidence that we will hopefully make some progress. I appreciate that you're pointing out that it it doesn't have to be politicized in the sense of if you want 
your data to be fair and you want your product to work everywhere and you want to presumably if you're a capitalist make money you'd like to sell it to everybody and if your product indirectly excluded someone then like we've we've all seen examples of uh, automatic soap dispensers that can't see different colors of skin uh, that would certainly block you out of a market so you should probably you say train your data under fairness constraints maybe you could talk about fairness constraints Sure. So that really starts with going back to the tech spec for any ML algorithm that you are going to train. And so when you are trying to reduce ethical debt in your product, you are going to have to answer two questions in that product specification phase. You're going to have to talk about which methods of fairness you will use and how you're going to prioritize them. And the reason this is important is because building a product based on ML isn't if you're doing this, it's not enough to reactively fix bugs or pull products from the the shelves. You'll have to answer these questions in your tech spec so that you're thinking about them from the start of the life cycle. And this is also the time to exclude sensitive attributes like race, religion from the data set you're going to use to train the algorithm. If you're going to include them, you need to make a specific documented case for why that's appropriate, not just for your users, but also because we are slowly but surely starting to see more regulation on the tech world, especially in Europe, but we're seeing the early stages of it in uh, the states as well. And so you, I think we're going to see more tech companies be more accountable for their creations in ways that they haven't been previously. So documentation, I know tech teams don't always love it, but it's really essential before you get moving on the, the next steps here. Are you looking for an alternative Maps API provider? At TomTom, we have over 28 years experience in perfecting our maps and technology. We believe in freedom of choice, meaning no advertising, no subscription, and no need for a credit card on file. Visit developer.tomtom.com to get access to 2,500 daily free API transactions and unlimited access to our maps and traffic flow tiles within our Maps SDKs for Android and iOS. Until September 30th, you can get an extra 10,000 credits by going to developer.tomtom.com dot com slash promo using the promo code Hansel Minutes exclusively for Hansel Minutes listeners. That's developer.tomtom.com slash promo using promo code Hansel Minutes. Can we make this better by allowing people to have custom models? So you can have a baseline model and they custom uh, the ability to basically adjust something on a user by user basis, tagging your own data, perhaps, I guess. That's an interesting question. So tag data is definitely a key step. I would say prior to that, or in tandem with it, you should be training your data under fairness constraints, like you mentioned earlier. And this step is important, but also difficult, because when you try to control or eliminate direct or indirect bias, you're going to find yourself in a catch-22 related to the algorithm's accuracy. So if you train exclusively on non-sensitive attributes, you will eliminate direct discrimination, but you'll introduce or reinforce direct bias. But you can't train separate classifiers for each sensitive feature because that will reintroduce direct discrimination. So to reduce these risks, you don't want to just measure the average strengths of acceptance and rejection across sensitive groups. Instead, what you can do is use limits to determine what is or isn't included in the model you're training. And when you do this, discrimination tests are expressed as restrictions and limitations on the learning process, which can ease the risk of bias creeping in. Mm -hmm. Is this concept of, of, of ethical debt, is that something that you came up with? Where did that name come from? Because it really is an excellent way to express technical debt as it relates to machine learning. I can't take full credit for it. I first read that term on the new stack, um, which is a great publication by Alex Williams that talks about different open source topics, uh, and particularly in the IT and business intelligence space. And one of their, the new stacks writers wrote a piece on ethical debt at the start of the year. And I thought that concept was a perfect way to explain what we're discussing. I will give myself a little bit of credit for coming up with the correlation between ethical debt and technical debt, because at the end of the day, that's really what it is. If the algorithm is found to be unacceptably 
biased, you have to retrain it and start all over. And that's a misnomer that I think a lot of people have in the business world. They don't often think about the technical requirements of technologies that are complex before they adopt them. I spoke at Barnard College last year and a consultant for IBM came up to me after the talk because she was in charge of selling Watson to people. And she said the number one question she got was, what do you mean I have to train it? Mm. They they just thought that they were getting this full fledged product that was going to solve all of their business challenges without understanding all of the enormous work that they would have to do with Watson to customize it for their business. And so if you don't have the technical talent in house, adopting a product like Watson really isn't going to get you that far. And there's a real, I think, lack of education around. AI and products in general. And I, to your point about what the role of an analyst is, I think that's a big aspect of our job as well. Mm -hmm. The thing that scares me the most about just machine learning and AI in general is that it is a black box. It's almost, it's a, it is a function that someone wrote that you can't see inside. Like you can't see the source code of the model. You can only see the training data that created the model, which is itself a magical black box where something goes in and something comes out, you know, some text goes in and some sentiment analysis goes out and it works in 2019, but then maybe some new slang comes out in 2022. And now your sentiment analysis thing kicks off the wrong results because the kids are using a new, a new term and then you have to go and retrain it. And if people can't see inside it, they're just going to change the code around it and not redo the training data. People are not going to revise their models. Exactly. And I, that's also a great example because that really gets to the heart of why machine bias is such a problem. It's, it really relates to black box algorithms. We often don't know how these algorithms make decisions. Even their creators don't know how they make decisions. And this is really most pronounced in a product called Compass, which is a machine learning algorithm that has been used to predict defendants' re-likelihoods of recidivism. And research from ProPublica, a nonprofit journal journalism outlet found that Compass was making incorrect decisions correlated with race. So they were incorrectly cr predicting that Black defendants were more likely to recommit crimes, and they were incorrectly predicting that white defendants were more likely to recommit crimes. But both Ex both predictions were wrong. And this isn't a hypothetical product. Judges in over a dozen US states have used Compass's outputs to impact the sentences of defendants, whether they were, were released on parole or whether they got longer sentences. And when one person impacted by Compass's results tried to take his case to the Supreme Court, the judges actually refused to hear it. And that, to me, sets a really dangerous legal precedent because it signals that more than half of Supreme Court justices were willing to trust how the Compass algorithm was making decisions, even when those decisions were wrong. And so that... Uh, really sets, again, a problematic legal precedent for how AI will be regulated or not. The good news is that if you have someone to monitor your data sets throughout the product lifecycle, this can be mitigated. So the developers often build training sets based on data they hope their models will encounter in deployment, but many of them don't monitor the data that they will receive in deployment. And ML products are unique in the sense that they're constantly taking in new data and refining the results based on mm. that data. But the problem, as mentioned, is that when they encounter different data, that could have a negative impact. And so it's also not uncommon for algorithms to update without the model them itself being revalidated. And mm -hmm. so if you have someone on your team who's monitoring the source, history, and context of the data in your algorithm, not just in production, but also in deployment, they can conduct continuous audits and find unacceptable behavior. Yeah. It also seems like if people are, some people are you saying they're refining their algorithms and they're refining their models. Other people, other people aren't, but the idea that the average Joe or Jane doesn't understand it, much less understand code. I think we've all read and heard when machine, uh, when, uh, lawyers and judges try to understand like even basic code. Like I've, I've been involved in lawsuits where there's an analysis of an algorithm and the quote unquote algorithm is like a couple of for loops, right? It's not rocket surgery. If you then introduce 
machine learning and artificial intelligence to it, they have no idea what's going on. How can they possibly litigate or understand that uh, and, and do the right thing? It's really just rolling the dice. Right. And I think the the key there is not so much that everyone should be sk- so skilled on machine learning that they can read and interpret code. It's more about having the general awareness that algorithms are not unbiased. And that is mm. important for the, the devs and product teams to know who are building these creations. But it's important for everyone to know it. I would argue it's very important for Supreme Court justices to not blindly trust algorithms that are being used to make incorrect projections about whether a person is more likely or less likely to recommit a crime, they should instead be asking, how did you make that decision and holding the creators accountable for those decisions. And so it's not about, again, understanding the code at a really deep level. It's about understanding that algorithms have their own biases, just like people, especially mm-hmm. in, as we're in this stage where we are trying to get closer to general AI, where it does more closely mimic the thought processes and decisions of humans. That means if you're taking that to its lo- logical conclusion, that the AI could potentially get even more biased. And so then it becomes even more important to introduce measures from the start to mitigate it. Okay, so if we explain that to non-technical parent or partner, and they start to understand that algorithms exist, and that the algorithms uh, sometimes are generated, sometimes are written, uh, sometimes have bias, how do we and should we separate the humans that wrote it from the algorithm? Like, for example, if we use Facebook, like, is there an evil mustache twirling programmer who made a biased algorithm? And should non-technical parent think that? Or is it that humans are complicated and messy meat bags and we sometimes screw up. Like how much should we consider malice in the terms of bias in AI versus incompetence? Definitely the latter. It's definitely not a Wizard of Oz scenario where there's one person behind the curtain pulling puppet strings. It really is very easy for bias to creep into an algorithm for many of the reasons mentioned. And oftentimes, again, the creators of these algorithms can't see how they made decisions. The other thing that you have to consider is that the more fair an algorithm becomes, the more of an increase in risk you have that an algorithm won't be accurate. And so it's a delicate trade-off in fairness versus accuracy that, again, you have to define at the outset. So it's not in either, I don't want to frame this as an either or scenario because you can have an algorithm that is both unbiased and accurate, but you do have to account for that as well, uh, because those are, again, there are so many factors that going into the algorithm because they're built on endless neurons. And so you have to just be thinking about these things from the start once before you go in and start training the models. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the listener is now sufficiently overwhelmed and probably thinking, well, I should just not touch this at all. I shouldn't even introduce uh, AI and ML into my product. What would you tell them? I would tell them that in many ways, it has never been easier to be working on algorithms that are unbiased because we are fortunate in that 2018 in particular saw the release of many different open source data sets that you can use to train your algorithms. And that has historically been a big barrier is not only the volume of data, but how specific it is. You mentioned tagging earlier, and that's a very important aspect of building algorithms that are fair. Tagging refers to classes that are present in an image and their locations. And this sounds simple until you realize how much work it would take to draw shapes around every single person in a photo of a crowd, or you would draw a box around every single person on a highway. Even if you succeeded, you might rush the tagging and you might draw your shape sloppily, and that would lead to a neural network that's poorly trained. But there are to that point, more products coming to market. One example is 
a data annotation project called Brain Builder, and they use open source frameworks like TensorFlow to help users manage and annotate the training data. It also aims to bring diverse class examples to data sets so that you can teach algorithms positive examples of something and negative examples of something. So I would encourage people who are interested in building algorithms that are less biased to seek out date training sets that they can use on places like GitHub. Brain Builder is a product that is worth looking into. There are more options than ever to build unbiased algorithms. And so I would encourage them to go the open source route. And that really goes back to the crucial role that transparency plays in building these algorithms. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you chatting with me today, Lauren Maffeo, all about bias and AI. And I'll be sure to include links to uh, Lauren's articles on the next web and on opensource.com. And th- thanks for the work that you're doing, helping to put uh, all of this into context. Thanks so much for having me. I had a great time talking to you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 